are glad you're here, as we always say. We really are glad you're here, and uh, we're glad you're out there. And uh, we want to, I want to bring an encouraging word, uh, something kind of like a, I likened myself this morning as a football coach with a team that may be a bunch of underdogs, but are about to embark on the Super Bowl. <laughs> like, a, like a little league team playing in the World Series. I, I want to encourage you today. I think we need to be encouraged and uh, grab your Bibles and go ahead and turn to the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings. Uh-oh, wait a minute. No, not 1 Kings, y'all. I, I, I grabbed the wrong tab. I'm sorry. Man. Judges. Judges chapter 3. Judges chapter 3. Man. Uh, Judges chapter 3. And before we get into the Word, I want to probably remind you, you've probably seen it all week long, at least I have, and There is a young man by the name of Oliver Anthony. And Oliver Anthony is a very uh, unknown, well, he's not unknown anymore. He He was very unknown. And he wrote a song about what is going on in America. And he basically writes songs pouring his heart out. He's what you would call maybe a country bluegrass kind of musician. Nobody ever knew of him. He didn't want to be known. But overnight, he is an overnight sensation. And although I don't personally agree with the foul language that he uses, his lyrics will hit you right between the eyes and they will hit you right in the heart. Okay, I, I, will, I will not say that, um, uh, I would be a liar if I said that out of frustration, I have not ever uttered four letter words that I shouldn't have uttered, okay? So I don't stand in judgment of him, but I want to read to you a letter that he just wrote this past week, and then we'll go into the Word. Oliver Anthony writes this, It's been difficult as I browse through the 50,000 plus messages and emails I have received in the last week. The stories that have been shared paint a brutally honest picture. Suicide, addiction, unemployment, anxiety, and depression. Hopelessness, and the list goes on. I'm sitting in such a weird place in my life right now. I never wanted to be a full-time musician, much less sit at the top of the iTunes charts. Draven from Radio West Virginia and I filmed these tunes on my land with the hope that I might hit 300,000 views. I still don't quite believe what has went on since we uploaded that. It's just strange to me. People in the music industry give me blank stares when I brush off $8 million offers. I don't want six tour buses, 15 tractor trailers, and a jet. I don't want to play stadium shows. I don't want to be in the spotlight. I wrote the music I wrote because I was suffering with mental health and depression. These songs have connected with millions of people on such a deep level because they're being sung by someone feeling the words in the very moment they were being sung. No editing, no agent, no poop. Just some idiot and his guitar. The style of music that we should have never gotten away from in the first place. So that being said, I have never taken the time to tell you who I actually am. Here's a formal introduction. My legal name is Christopher Anthony Lunsford. My grandfather was Oliver Anthony, and Oliver Anthony Music 
is a dedication not only to him, but 1930s Appalachia, where he was born and raised. Dirt floors, seven kids, hard times. At this point, I'll gladly go by Oliver because everyone knows me as such, but my friends and family still call me Chris. You can decide for yourself, either way is fine. In, 19, in, in 2010, I dropped out of high school, and at age 17, I have a GED from Spruce Pine, North Carolina. I worked multiple plant jobs in western North Carolina, my last being at the paper mill in McDowell County. I worked third shift six days a week for $14.50 an hour in a living hell. In 2013, I had a bad fall at work and fractured my skull. It forced me to move back home to Virginia. Due to complications from the injury, it took me six months or so before I could work again. From 2014 until just a few days ago, I've worked outside sales in the industrial manufacturing world. My job has taken me all over Virginia and into the Carolinas getting to know tens of thousands of other blue-collar workers on job sites and in factories. I spent all day every day for the last 10 years hearing the same story. People are so tired of being neglected, divided, and manipulated. In 2019, I paid $97,000 for the property and still owe about $60,000 on it. I am living in a 27-foot camper with a tarp on the roof that I got off Craigslist for $750. There's nothing special about me. I'm not a good musician. I'm not a very good person. I spent the last five years struggling with mental health and using alcohol to drown it. I am sad to see the world in the state it's in with everybody fighting each other. I have spent many nights feeling hopeless that the greatest country on earth is quickly fading away. That being said, I hate the way the internet has divided all of us. The internet is a parasite that infects the minds of humans and has their way with them. Hours wasted, goals forgotten, loved ones sitting in houses with each other, distracted all day by technology made by the hands of other poor souls in sweatshops in a foreign land. When is enough enough? When are we going to fight for what is right again? Millions have died protecting the liberties we have. Freedom of speech is such a precious gift. Never in, the world, never in world history has the world had the freedom it currently does. Don't let them take it away from you. Just like those wandering in the desert, we have lost our way from God and have let false idols destruct us and divide us. It's a darn shame. I read that, And I think about how God raises up ordinary people in extraordinary times. I, I'll, I'll say this, I didn't come up with this sermon on my own. Part of it was what I just read you, and part of it was another preacher who does little short videos, like a minute long that I get about every other day. And he mentioned part of the text, part of the text that we're going to look at today. But I, like you and many others, look around and, and I really do get depressed sometimes at what's going on in the world. But at the same time, I have to ask myself, I have to be honest with myself, what am I doing about it? Okay? What, what, what am I doing about it? What can... Sometimes I just say, Lord, what can I do? Right? I mean, I can't march into the White House and say, thus saith the Lord. You know, and wag my finger like Moses did in front of Pharaoh. Unless God makes a way. I'm not saying He can't, but it, the way I see it, I don't see that happening without getting tackled by a bunch of Secret Service agents. Right? and hauled off to some gulag somewhere. But, folk, listen. Every one of us are ordinary. Every one of us that stand before me or sit before me right now are just ordinary people. 
And can I say this? I like ordinary people. I like normal people. I like people that work a 40-hour week. I, I, I like those kind of people. Okay? Uh, uh, you can ask my wife. I don't mind hanging out with drunks on a street corner. Okay? Because I want to give them the gospel. That's my desire. I want to see them be better. But many times, like you, I ask myself, am I doing enough? Am I doing enough? What can I do, Lord? (laughs) What can I do? There are three people I want us to look at today briefly. And you've all heard of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? But let me ask you a question. Have you heard of Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar? (laughs) Have you heard those names before? (laughs) These are three great guys. But they're ordinary people. Right? I, I, I was thrilled when I found out one of them was a farmer. Okay? I was like, well, if that farmer can do it, so can I. It gave me encouragement. I'm here, I'm here today to give you encouragement. That as long as there's breath in your lungs, God can still use you. Amen? So look at this in Judges chapter 3, beginning in verse 9. I want to set the stage for you. This is not long after Joshua. You remember Joshua? Joshua and Caleb that went into the promised land? Well, not very long after, uh, God's people had great victories and they went into the promised land and got to eat some of them grapes that were the size of bowling balls and, and, and everything. And not long after that, well, as they often do, as we've read in the, all of us have read in the Old Testament, they started falling away from God. Here's what happened. Verse 9 of Judges chapter 3, When the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the sons of Israel to deliver them. Now what had happened was they got into sin and they got into trouble. Okay, It's just the way all through the Old Testament, God's people... We're serving him, serving him, serving him, and backslid and backslid and backslid, and he sent an army in to capture them and lay waste to their cities and everything. We all know the story, right? Well, they cried out to God, We've sinned, forgive us, send us a deliverer. (laughs) So, here's who they sent. Othniel. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. Now look at this. I want, you to, I want to point out something to you. The Word of the Lord says, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. He didn't already have it. You hear me? Obviously, it had to come upon him. It wouldn't have come upon him if he already had it. Right? The Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel. When he went out to war, the Lord gave... Now, folks, this is one of them big words. If y'all can pronounce it, more power to you. Kushan... Rish Athame. I'm doing the best I can. King of Mesopotamia into his hand so that he prevailed over Cushan. Then the land had rest for 40 years and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Now look at this. He raised this man up for a particular time in history, right? Obviously, we've never heard of 
Othniel before, and it says that he only lived a short time after this. Okay? What does it say? 40 years. And what gets me is this one man, for a moment, was, he was in obscurity, and for a moment, God's Spirit comes upon him, in other words, calls him, and says, Othniel, I've got a job for you. I've got something for you to do. And obviously, he said, okay, Lord, I'll do it. So God's Spirit came upon him. It, it, it literally infiltrated him. And, and I got to thinking about this. I got to pondering it. And I was like, I bet it gave him strength that he didn't have before. I bet it gave him mental clarity that he didn't have before. I bet it gave him a warrior spirit that he didn't have before. Obviously it did, because it says this. When, it, not only did he judge Israel, in other words, he stood before Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, you have sinned, you need to repent. Okay? And, and obviously, Israel repented because God then said to Othniel, He said, go get them. Those that have done my people wrong, go get them. This was the king of Mesopotamia. Okay? Mesopotamia at that time was not like Moody, Texas. A little Bohunk town with 250 people in it. Mesopotamia was huge, right? This was a great and powerful king. What does it say he did? He went out to war. The Lord gave Kushan, who's the king of Mesopotamia, into his hand so that he prevailed over Kushan. Then the land had rest for 40 years and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. He got his reward. But here we go again. <laughs> Look at verse 12. Now the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel. Now here come the Moabites. Because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered to himself the sons of Ammon and Amalek, and he went and defeated Israel, and they possessed the city of palm trees. The sons of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Oh, well, here they go again. Right back into captivity. Okay? I kind of liken it as a little kid that won't learn their lesson. Right? They get into trouble. They get a whooping. Mama sends them to their room. They come back out. Mama, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. <laughs> they get a whoop. They do it again, get a whooping, get sent right back to their room. Right? So here's the sons of Israel serving Eglon the king of Moab for 18 years. But look here. Look here. Verse 15. Ordinary people. But when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer from them. Deliverer number two. Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite. Now look at this. I don't know why. I looked in the notes. I couldn't figure it out. It says the Benjamite, a left-handed man. And the sons of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. In other words... They're figuring out how to get out of the mess they're in. Okay? Now watch this very carefully, what this man is tasked with doing. Ehud 
made himself a sword which had two edges, a cubit in length, which would be about that long, just over 18 inches. And he bound it on his right thigh under his cloak. He presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Here's what he's doing, okay? He's taking some money or something fancy to this king to pay tribute to the king, right? But there's an underlying thing, okay? We're in captivity. We can't beat this army, but we can sure beat their king. Look what happens. He presented the tribute to Egon, king of Moab. Now, Egon was a very fat man. It came about when he had finished presenting the tribute that he sent away the people who had carried the tribute. In other words, it must have been a lot of stuff. Okay, they came walking in with all this stuff. He told all the servants, set it down and get out of here. But he himself turned... Um, but he himself turned back from the idols which were at Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. He says, hey man, I, here's your tribute. All I'm asking is I need to talk to you in private. And he said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he said, keep silence. And all who attended him left him. So they emptied the room that they were in except for um, Ehud and the king. Ehud came to him while he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat. Ehud stretched out his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. Uh Uh-oh. The handle also went in after the blade. And the fat closed over the blade, for he did not draw the sword out of his belly, and the refuse came out. In other words, what was inside spilled outside. Then Ehud went out into the vestibule and shut the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. He's killed the king. When he had gone out, his servants came and looked, and behold, the doors of the roof chamber were locked, and they said, He is only relieving himself in the cool room. They waited until they became anxious, but behold, he did not open the doors of the roof chamber. Therefore they took the key and opened them, and behold, their master had fallen to the floor dead. Now listen, why in the world this crazy story? Ordinary man, the Spirit of God comes over him, says, I've got a job for you to do, you're going to go take out this king. God's assassination plan. But it was to free the Israeli people. When I read this, I, I had never before ever read this. And I've never seen, I don't think, something as graphic written in the Word of God. (laughs) I mean, when it says He stuck him, He stuck him good. Okay? You ever hear to the hilt? Well, He went past the hilt into the handle and left it there and the fat closed in around it. That's rough, y'all. Don't you want to hear stuff like that right before lunch? But look what happens. <laughs> and he said to them, wait a minute, verse 26, Now Ehud escaped while they were delaying, and he passed by the idols, escaped to Shira. It came about when he had arrived that he blew the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim, and the sons of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was in front of them. He said to them, Pursue them, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him and seized the fords of the Jordan opposing opposite Moab and did not allow anyone to cross. They struck down 
at that time about 10,000 Moabites, a robust and va- all robust and valiant men, and no one escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land was undisturbed for 80 years. 80 years. <laughs> Man. Two, so far, ordinary people that were called upon by God to do extraordinary things. I remember the story that my mother told me of going and visiting right after my mother and my dad had gotten married around... um, This would have been right before, might have been right during World War II, 1940-ish, something like that. Mom was born in 30. So this might have been right at the end of the war, probably right after World War II. They went to visit her aunt who lived in Appalachia, up on a mountain, in a cabin, no electricity, strictly off-grid, living off the land. While mom and dad were there, her aunt went into labor. My mother had to step up and deliver the baby. (laughs) And because of that, her aunt named the baby Ann, which was my mom's name. And I just, hearing my mom tell the story, I was like, Mom, you really delivered a baby? (laughs) And she was like, well, somebody had to. You know, (laughs) pretty crazy. Ordinary people in extraordinary times. The one I want to focus on here, (laughs) the next one, Shamgar in verse 31, it says this, 80 years of peace. (laughs) Evidently, the Philistines come on the come on the scene. Now we all know about the Philistines, right? The Philistines have been harassing Israel from time and memoriam, right? <laughs> verse 31, there is a little short one verse story about one guy. And all it says is this. After him came Shamgar the son of Anath who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad, and he also saved Israel. That's it. (laughs) That's all it says about Shamgar. You know what an ox goad is? An ox goad was a long pointy stick. Okay? Okay? Pointed on one end with a kind of a metal point on one end so you could poke the oxen to get them going. And on the other end was flat for like digging and things. Okay, it's called an ox goad. It goaded the ox. I'm sure he stood there and poked them and went, goad ox. But he's so unknown. Just a farmer. Just a farmer out there (laughs) goading his oxen. (laughs) Walking behind a plow. Just doing his thing. Right? Walking behind his plow. Plowing his field. Poking the oxen. Come on, oxen. One more acre. Right? Right? I got to get the seed in the ground before it rains. And then God speaks to him and says, you're a mighty warrior. (laughs) And I'm sure he was looking around going, who? (laughs) I'm just a farmer. You know? I mean, when I think of that, I, I, I picture in my mind Some old farmer, barefoot with a straw hat and bib overalls, walking behind a wooden plow, poking the mules to get them to go. 
But God's in that moment, God reached down and said, I'm giving you my power. And you're going to do great things. What did he do? <laughs> Struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. And, by the way, <laughs> I love the way this is written. Oh, and by the way, he saved Israel. Three men, Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. I don't have time, I wish I did, to go into a young lady named Deborah, who is a prophetess. <laughs> wish I had time, but I don't. Maybe we'll go into that some other time. But ordinary, plain Jane quiet, just want to live their lives, people. Just like Oliver Anthony. Just pouring his heart out with a guitar. And his song sweeps the nation. <clears throat> He's got billionaire record labels Coming up to him saying, buddy, if you'll sign on the dotted line, I'll give you $8 million right now. He said, don't want your money. I don't want your private jet. I don't want your big tour bus. I don't want your stadium shows. I just want to be heard. And you know, at one of his concerts, there's a video. <laughs> Before he sang his song that he is now famous for, he opened up the Word of God to Psalms 32, talking about how God rescues His people. It's amazing for such a time as this. For such a time as this. Well, let me tell you, any one of us can be called up at any time to do extraordinary things for God. I don't remember the man's name, but in the Revolutionary War, there was a preacher that had a nice congregation of good people. But one morning... He took off his clerical robes, took off his collar, put on the uniform of a general in the Revolutionary War. He walked into church that morning with a Bible in one hand and a sword on his hip. Stood up in his pulpit in his new uniform and said, for such a time as this, God has called me to serve this nation. Not only to serve you, but to serve this nation. And because of men like him and other men that stood up at the right time, we now have this place called the United States of America. Many times they fought against the British and won. Ordinary people in or extraordinary times. Say, but Brother Charlie, those are all nice stories, but what does that have to do with, with me? It has everything to do with you. Everything. Every one of us, man, woman, or child, needs to have our hearts open enough that if God calls us, we're ready to go. We're ready to do. Maybe you're just called to be a good mommy. Maybe you're just called right now to be a good daddy. But you know what? You may have to stand up at a school board meeting and say, Thus saith the Lord, My child's here for reading, writing, and arithmetic. 
not for social things. You may have to do that, as many, 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 many parents have had to do so far. You may be called to lead a church. You may be called to plant a church. (laughs) You know? You may be called to, to serve at the homeless shelter. You never know. I, with my vivid imagination, I see one of you getting the call to go serve at some place like My Brother's Keeper down on the railroad tracks in downtown Waco and you lead one to Christ that everyone else thinks is hopeless, but somehow you've got to, you make a relationship with that person and they become one of the greatest preachers of all time, another Billy Graham. Folk, it could happen. And not just in my imagination. (laughs) Maybe God's calling you to serve sandwiches to the homeless on Saturday nights. I don't know. For such a time as this. You know, every now and then, Waco, Texas has had great leaders, presidents that have visited. You may have the opportunity to walk up to a president of the United States or past president or future president, shake their hand and look them in the eye and say, thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. And that moment may last less than a minute, but maybe you made an impact on a world leader God and, and you walk away from there not thinking you've said anything, but maybe you've said it all. You know? Because it was from God's heart through your lips to, to their heart, you know? Folk, listen. There's not a single solitary person in the sound of my voice that is, God's done with. You hear me? God's not done with any single one of us. None of us. I don't care what we've been through. I don't care how old we are. I mean, look at people in the Bible like Anna and Simeon. (laughs) Anna said, well, my husband's dead. (laughs) Don't need to deal with that mess anymore. I'm going to go serve God. God's going to be my husband. I'm going to go to work in the temple. And because of that, God gave her a promise. You're going to get to see your Savior. And she stood there in the center of the temple holding her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Don't discount yourself, folks. Don't discount yourself. You're great and mighty when God uses you. You just got to be willing. Don't play a Jonah and run the other way. Because you know when Jonah repented, And he went and did what God asked him to do. A whole city got saved. Amen. The king of that city fell on his face before a holy God and repented. You got everything you need. God's given you everything you need. He's not done with you. Amen. Amen. Please don't forget that. Please don't forget that. You may have been through some tragedy and you wonder, why did I have to go through this? Well, maybe it's because somewhere down the road you're going to minister to someone else that's going through it. And maybe you can only speak those words. It's kind of like an alcoholic talking to an alcoholic. You know, they understand because they've been through it. God bless you today. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this story. Lord, we thank You for Your Word, and God, we thank You for everything written in it. We thank You for examples of these three great men. Lord, they were just ordinary men, but Lord, You used them in extraordinary ways and extraordinary times. God, allow each and every single one of us to have our lives open to You enough to where You can come in and Your Spirit fall on us and we do extraordinary things for You, Lord. 
It's through your power that we would do it. Lord, we pray for that one that needs to do business with you today. We pray for that one that needs salvation. We pray for that one that's hurting. Lord, we pray for that backslidden Christian that needs to repent. Lord, I pray your your spirit fall on us right now and God that we do serious business with you. And God, we'll give you all the honor and the praise and the glory for it. Help us not to hold back. We thank you, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen.